Welcome to Noster Devs number nine. <laughs> All right, we're live. We're on Zapstream. Um, I'm going to do this thing I like to do where I'll pay out um, 20,000 sats for the best question. So if anyone wants to uh, send a question in the chat, just go to zap.stream. All right, um, we're going to kick it off by jumping into data vending machines and Cascader. And it, there's been a lot of hype about DVMs. I honestly still don't really know what they are. So I'm going to turn it over to Uncle Jim to get into it. What's up, guys? My name's Uncle Jim 21. Um, I've been kind of working on this space of, you know, how do we relate API services, specifically AI, into Noster and Lightning uh, and L402s. So this is something I'm passionate about. Um, I, I, uh, Captain Stacks kind of launched this on me. I have talked about in the past how I like that people are working on this problem. One approach on this has been DVMs, which stands for data vending machines. And the idea is that a client can post a service that they're looking for and then, uh, over web sockets and then onto relays. And then service providers can scan the network and find those and then provide the services. There are some advantages to doing that way. I took a look and there were two primary concerns I had with that. Firstly, I don't think the control flow makes sense. I don't think it makes sense for the buyer to announce publicly what they want and then for service providers to have to incur the cost of scanning the network to find those. I think it makes more sense for the service providers to just be dumb and basically just be API endpoints that are published on Noster, kind of using Noster sort of like Craigslist, just this is what I have, these are the inputs, these are outputs, this is what it costs. So I worked with uh, Topher Scott, he's sitting back there, and also with Austin and uh, another guy who's not here, Christian, who's in Canada, who helped us at TabConf um, uh, make an alternative to uh, DVMs, we call them data buffets, and that's I've built an application called C Cascader, which is on the back of that. So really, I had two issues with uh, with, with data vending machines. The first was that uh, there's uh, the control flow doesn't make sense to me. I think it's it, it, it'd be kind of like if you walked into uh, a uh, you know a grocery store and announced what you wanted, and then hope that the people the the egg monger or the milk monger comes to you and bids on you know the offer i don't think it makes sense it makes more sense to go shopping in a lot of cases there are some use cases where you know, maybe it's very bespoke and very unique so it makes sense to have the uh bu buyer initiate you know in in the case of you know like a a big contract that makes sense or something that's multifaceted maybe it makes sense but i think just in the Majority of use cases just makes sense for the client to go shopping and pick the best price, the best quality, the best privacy um, aspect they want. So, so that's why that's one of the main reasons why. But then also just upon further review, I have concerns about data vending machines privacy because you have the buyer announcing publicly on re, on publicly available relays what they're looking for, and I think that's a privacy nightmare. Not only is it not encrypted, it's not. It's it's totally public. It's not a ban. And you know, personally, I just think about how dangerous that can be. I have worked on other projects, like I work on Sphinx Chat. You know, we work on a lot of um, we work with a lot of people that are dissidents and some very repressive regimes. So I think about the fact that you know, a repressive regime, a state actor, could just be tracing what somebody's doing on DVMs. Or you know, there's examples of a guy from Russia that was running on his Strava app, his running app, and the FSB hunted him down and assassinated him. So it's like there's there's real world consequences for lack of privacy. So I think about that a lot. And I just, it, it doesn't sit right with me that we're, you know, we have this new thing that doesn't necessarily have to, um, you know, have to support for, you know, backward compatibility. We can start from scratch. And we're already incurring all this crazy technical debt just because that's the first way somebody thought of doing it. So I don't mean to be um, to start things, but I've, you know, in the past been pretty um, def deferential of DVMs and kind of just let them 
um, you know, said, you know, let let a thousand flowers bloom. Um, you know, maybe maybe they can improve their spec on these fronts. But um, I personally, I prefer the way we've done it with data buffets. I just want to jump in and say, like, so the theme for this uh, for this whole episode is going to be um, uh, looking at the potential downsides of all the apps that we're covering. So, uh, you know, it, it's good to think about what could go wrong with a software system. And um, so what I'm going to try to do is just put on my black hat and um, and ask, like, what could go wrong with these apps and what could go wrong with Noster in general? Good idea. Uh, did you want to? Do any demo on Cascader? Yeah, so let's dive into Cascader. So I, I previously mentioned, you know, I have an alternative strategy that I've developed with Topher and Austin sitting here. Uh, and the basic idea is that you just use Nostr like Craigslist. You publish your offerings, your L402s, how much they cost, what their inputs and outputs are. And then you can build applications like this that actually communicate out of band just over HTTP and let you run various workflows. So this example actually lets you he doesn't have he he doesn't have WebLN, so I can't run it. But this simple example lets you use ChatGPT to generate a text image prompt. So I could type in something really lazy like "Make me a cool picture," and it'll it'll actually fill that in. You know, it'll hallucinate a little bit. It'll fill that in and then um, feed it through to the text image prompt, and it's actually pretty good. So I actually earlier I, I don't know if you have it up. I sent you. A, um, one of the outputs. Did you did you open that up? I, I, I asked for like that. a landscape of the Amalfi Coast, and it was uh, it was great. Um, it was a good example. I have other ones here. I have five services that are available. So there's text to image generation. There's just general purpose LLMs. There's uh, uh, YouTube video extraction. So you guys should just pull the video. Uh, there's image to text. So actually analyze taking images, analyzing them. And then there's, uh, I forgot the last one, I think. It, oh, it's a uh, whisper transcription. So I have other, I have a bunch of examples that demonstrate these. So this, this one ha shows the LLMs in the text to image. This one has, um, has the YouTube video extraction followed by transcription. So this one will just transcribe. And then this one um, helps you appraise the value of items with just a picture. So you can take a picture and then appraise that item in, in sats in case you want to sell all your belongings in preparation for the bull run. <laughs> so <laughs> so I've, uh, I've kind of demonstrated the utility of each of these. And then you know this morning, I actually uh, released a proposal. I've been working with Topher on ways to make it uh, abstract and composable. So you can just make an arbitrary workflow and basically make Z Zapier, but, but with sats, with lightning. And uh, in a way, that's totally anonymous. So it's totally respecting of privacy. Um, something I, that, that I've previously stated today uh, is important to me. So um, if you get the chance, go check it out. Uh, Cascader.vercel.app. I did this for the Bolt.fun hackathon and i um, hoping to keep, keep this project going. Cool. All right, let's see if we got any questions yet. I don't see anything on the stream chat, okay. Uh, the next app I wanted to look at is Flockster, and it's a Noster alternative to meetup.com, but it's not just for um, in-person events, from my understanding. I think it also uh, is, is something like a mailing list, a way to keep track of, uh, of people who, who want to subscribe to your digital content. Um, I think it's really cool that they're trying to do a meetup replacement. But keeping with the theme today of, of the black hat, um, I, I want to acknowledge that what could go wrong with this is, uh, I mean, really similar to the example you gave. Let's say someone wants to set up an event that's, you know, for dissidents, right? Uh, everyone could just be doxing themselves on this app. It could be a really good honeypot for that kind of thing. So um, using Noster privately, is not really intuitive. Like someone could naively think that, oh, I made a new NPUB, no one can track me. Well, that, that's not true. Um, so it's 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 kind of one of the um, lingering problems with Noster. It's always been privacy. Uh, if you're not <laughs> really good with OPSEC, um, Noster is pretty bad for privacy. So I think I think Flockster is probably really good as a um, mostly read-only tool, a way to discover the events, but actually putting yourself out there as an RSVP might be something to to be careful about. What do you think? 
Yeah, I think I agree. I think uh, I think probably what this underscores, I think really the bedrock of a lot of OPSEC is going to be using a VPN. So I think if you're using something like Mulvad, you're paying in Bitcoin, uh, non-KYC Bitcoin, you know, maybe that helps buffer you a little bit against uh, the types of concerns you'd have. But I'm curious to hear what you think, you know, techniques would be to kind of protect yourself. If you someone put a gun to your head and said, hey, you got to use this thing privately, how would you go about doing it? Uh, I, I think you have to sort of look at the entire chain, the whole hardware stack you're using. Like, what what phone is it? What's the, What operating system? Is there anything linking your identity to that? And for me, it always turns into an endless rabbit hole that I don't really want to go down. So <laughs> I think if if I was put in that situation, I would probably have to spend like a week researching and getting myself up to speed on good OPSEC because it's not easy. Yeah. And also, I think that depends on your threat model, right? So if your threat model is the U.S. government, then it's probably pretty tough. You know, if it's maybe the Russian government, it's probably still tough, but maybe a little easier because maybe you've, you've I don't know, what do you think? Your threat model is just a stalker, right? Right. Now, your stalker doesn't have access to... Um, things that are private in, in the fiat sense. I like to right. refer to fiat privacy, which is like, trust us, bro. We have your data, but we're not gonna do anything bad with it. And that's what you get with most systems. Um, with Noster, that role is kind of on the relays. So the relay can see everything you're doing. Like if, if you're not masking your IP address somehow, then, then they're gonna be able to see that. Now, if the stalker isn't running a relay that got popular and now everyone's using it, well, that might be beyond their their grasp. So, yeah, it does depend on what what your threat model is. Good points. The next app I want to look at is kindzero.io. Uh, the intention behind this was for Nostr users to be able to generate a backup key pair that they could rotate to in case their key got compromised. Um, it's it's great it, it's great to uh, to try to have a solution for easily rotating to a new key, but I have some doubts about the approach that was taken here. And um, the only person I've seen on Noster that you know expressed any any sort of doubts that I'm aware of was Semisol. And usually I write him off as a troll, but I think he actually uh, brought up some good points where. There might be a vulnerability in this app. Um, I'm not going to go through the entire flow, but essentially what it does is it uses open timestamps to uh, to create events, Nostra events that are attesting to uh, you would before before anything gets compromised, you would have to use this app to create an attestation as to what your new key pair is going to be, what your new uh, public key would be, uh, and then. In the event of your key being compromised, then you would have to publish another event saying uh, from the new from the new NPUB saying, "Hey, I'm here now. Disregard the old the old key." And then there's like a 30 day waiting process. Uh, the The vulnerability I think has to do with that someone could an attacker could do an open timestamps attestation, but not publish the event. Um, that's as far as I looked into it. Uh, so I'm not really I'm not really sure if that all holds true, but I have my own issues with this approach because honestly I think that there's probably going to be maybe one person that this ever helps. You have to be you have to be already uh, thinking about it. You have to set it up ahead of time, like, and then you have this 30 day waiting process, which I think in reality most of the time I think through your actual uh, friend network through your social circles, I think people would find out within a matter of days if, if your account was compromised. So is this ever going to solve a real world problem? Maybe for one person, maybe not. I mean, that's kind of my take on it. I like that someone's trying to solve this problem, though. I think it's important to find a solution for key rotation. And if it, even if that solution is just, hey, these are my five buddies that three of five will attest that this is me, this is the real me now. Um, 
What, I, what would you, what would be your preferred solution? I'm curious. Exactly what you said. I, what do you got? <laughs> I, like, I, I, I can't say anything about the 30 day aspect, but this is a valuable feature. I think for a lot of people who are not realizing it, like how would I onboard a company like mm. an officer, where like my company, for example, well, I'm not unemployed, but if I <laughs> worked at a company, uh, <laughs> like it's like, okay, now the whole marketing team is going to be controlling this one key. And it's going to be signing events and it's going to be passing it back and forth. Right. It's a nightmare. You build up this reputation and then once it's stolen, it's gone forever. The ability to have like a backup and cold storage that no one needs to use, but allows you to reclaim all of your social credit and identity, like migrate it over effectively. Like I, I think that's an important feature for like different kinds of users. I agree with Austin. And I, I also think you know, another point that's tested is marketing people probably have great OPSEC, right, Austin? I mean, yeah. you know, that's that's the concern. Well, I mean, you know, that you just said they're passing it around, right? Like they're like who knows how they're doing it, right? Even if you've got an important brand, if your if your brand one private key is sitting in Alabama, it's sitting on a browser, it's like it's just a matter of time. Right. Either way, it's like no matter what, that key that you have to actively use, you don't want to be investing in that in the long term. Building, a, building infrastructure on top of that. Uh, yeah, and to circle back to the idea of just having uh, some trusted friends who can attest to um, what someone's new key is, I think it all comes back to that. I, I think that's the approach that makes sense. And I'll touch on that again later when we look at the Noster Graveyard app. Uh, right now, the next one is Yandar. And it's, um, I guess it's uh, like a crowdsourced mapping app. Um, maybe, it's, maybe it's similar to what OpenStreetMaps does, but I haven't really looked into it beyond that. Um, I just wanted to throw it out there in case anyone's heard of it or if there are any questions on it. Uh, the next one is Onboardster. This is one I really like because one of the problems in Noster since the beginning has been the centralization of the onboarding process. So if you onboard with Damas, you're automatically following, I believe you're following Damas and Will, is that correct? I'm not an iPhone guy, but maybe someone knows. I think that might be right. <laughs> so it automatically creates these, these giants, right? You know, like, like uh, was it Tom from MySpace? Is that, was that what it was? Back in the day, everyone was following Tom or whoever it was on MySpace. Um, so, you know, it's like, that's how people like get hundreds of thousands of followers on Noster when Noster only has like 25,000 active users. Um, so what Onboardster does is it's a way that I can create a link to share to someone who is interested in checking out Noster and the onboarding process is going to use the relays and contact list that I configure for them. And I think that's great because it's decentralized, right? I'm, it's, you know, I know the person, so I can try to set it up how I think they're gonna like it, right? If they're not a Bitcoiner, I can have them not following uh, Bitcoin accounts. I can set up the relays in a way that I think is gonna be good. And that's an important part of decentralization because, um, you know, the, the architecture is decentralized, but hard-coded relay lists are definitely a centralization vector. Got anything? Yeah. yeah, I think I definitely like this approach. I worry that it won't scale. I think that in the long run, I don't think it matters because Noster is still kind of small. So fine, we're all Bitcoiners. But I, yeah, I agree that just from uh, a user standpoint, you definitely want to have some process of these are the things i'm actually interested in so this is what i'm going to follow i actually tried out primal's new app yesterday so i this is kind of fresh in my mind i did i did like the way they broke it up but what i thought was interesting was by default you're following like all of the lists they set so they have like a list for you know general purpose uh influencers what do you think might be like uh dorsey and i don't know like chris cyborg ufc fighter you know, and then some other people, and then there's devs, and then there's uh, there's human rights people, so Gladstein and like Snowden. So I thought it was cool how they broke it up that way, but I think ideally, even better than that, 
even more ethical than that would be like totally not loading the box or not uh, asking a loaded question like that. Just being like, what are you into? Here's a list of things, you know, like a lot of apps do. And then it's being like, here's some suggested account accounts or is it okay if we auto follow some of these people for you? Like, I like that people are thinking about onboarding. It's early. So people are just experimenting. So I'm not going to be harsh on it. I do think if this thing really does mature. It is almost unethical to kind of just put yourself at the front. I do think uh, we should challenge the clients to embrace, you know, being open and having some, maybe there's like an open endpoint or open spec that just totally pulls in the topics and then randomizes the accounts or something. Well, I don't know. Keeping with the way Noster likes to use micro apps, I, I can't really see a better approach than having something like this, a separate onboarding app. Um, and it could be a lot more sophisticated. It could have where you, where it the, asks you the what UX and scalability ability sucks though. You need, you would almost want this to be like a web view in the app or something like that, or just an endpoint that does what this would normally do. But yeah, if there but was a false, way, but false and decentralized, you know, if there was a way for apps to include micro apps within them that they can't really touch, that they can't mess with in right. some way, that would be really cool. That, that's the ideal is this, this approach, but baked into every app. And it's almost like, well, you don't do it this way, then I'm not going to use your app, something like that. I like I that. I like <laughs> that. All right. The next one is truevote.org. And it looks like a lot of effort has gone into this, so it's pretty intriguing. Um, from what I understand, it's uh, it's trying to do digital voting in a way where people can vote uh, and have their digital votes um, attested to on the blockchain. Um, I I have some skepticism right off the bat. Uh, it's using open timestamps which I think is great for certain things, but I'm concerned about it in the context of a voting system because to me, it's, it's sort of a black box. And what if, um, what if the API provider is, is censoring votes or, or what if they just go down, technical problems happen? What's the workaround for that? And it's not feasible to just say, well, everyone who's voting just has to, it's on them to make sure their vote is recorded on the blockchain, right? So. I mean, I could just be naive about um, open timestamps. It might be more robust than I'm giving it credit for. Uh, and I like I like that people are exploring the the digital voting ideas, but I don't think it's ready for any kind of political election because you're always you're always going to have an opportunity for people to say, "Oh, there was a problem with the votes. We have to adjust it." Like. You know, someone could be like, my my key was compromised. I didn't really vote for this person. And so what's neat about Bitcoin and in the Bitcoin white paper, it talks about um, disintermediation, right? You have a system where um, transactions are final. There's no ar there's no person who can sit there and arbitrate. And that's really good for certain things. And it'd be, I think it'd be cool to have a voting system that works that way and I don't I don't think we're there yet with the technology. What do you think? I, I find this problem really interesting for a couple of reasons. First, um, first, firstly, because I think it's it, it seems like in Bitcoin, there's really two camps. One is like, OK, we believe in democracy. We are going to use these systems and we are going to verify the votes. And the other side's more like agorists. They're like, we need to just tear the whole system down. Democracy is, you know, it is it is uh, <laughs> democracy is you know a charade that allows people to uh, steal. Um, so I, I kind of fall more in the latter. So I don't have a strong. I, it's not like this is an emotional topic for me, but it is also interesting to me because I work uh, with Sphinx and Stack Work, and they did a really interesting project. Shout out to uh, Edvardo who led that effort. But basically, what they did is they created like a workflow that allowed them to help verify the Guatemalan elections, which were hotly contested. Guatemala's had a, I think a center right government that's been in, in place for a long time. There's a lot of question marks around, are there, are their votes really valid uh, over there? And so they, they made a system that utilizes uh, Bitcoin and 
uh, human human labor, like the Lightning Network and human labor to verify votes and AI to verify votes. So I don't know all the nuts and bolts. You can actually they presented it at um, at, at adopting Bitcoin in El Salvador. So I would go watch that if you're really interested in this. But their approach was interesting. I think it was something along the lines of they take the ballots themselves and then somehow use AI to like anonymize it so you can't see it. You can't see who is voting and even who they're voting for, but you can have a human like help check like, yup, these numbers, because they vote in like caucuses over there. So it's like 20 people in a group and it's like, okay, these numbers add up. Like nobody like added that this up wrong. Nobody like messed with the final vote tally. This is correct. This is what we're entering into the system. And then they, I think they somehow use cryptographic proof with open timestamps as well. I'd have to triple check that. It seems like kind of a very complex system, but they process tons and tons of votes. I think millions of votes possibly don't quote me on that. Uh, and, and had pretty interesting results that, um, that prove, prove the result. And I think that, uh, that whole thing is kind of being used to contest uh, the res the end result. Like I think there might still be some corruption happening on top of that, where th where there's a party that's trying to circumvent the cryptographic proof. So I've heard rumors that it could get ugly over there, and I'm hoping it doesn't. But it's interesting that you can actually use cryptographic systems, technology, AI, Bitcoin to solve a problem like this. There's a lot more to dig into on this problem. Um, I've heard that, I think it's Estonia does some some kind of uh, cryptographic digital voting. And I my understanding is their system tends to work because it's a higher trust society and it probably wouldn't work. I don't think it would work with our political environment. They're always early adopters when it comes to technology, like with the internet, they were first. That, that doesn't surprise me that they're the type of country that would do that. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I, I think when when you have a structure where people uh, can pr tr uh, trust the process, it's easy to pull off something like that. I think here it would be a lot more difficult. Where I do think True Vote might be ready for prime time would be not in a political election, but just people online who want to form something, some something like a DAO. And I think it would be a good way to govern things like that. You could do it for something as simple as just running a relay and you want to vote on what the rules are. All right, the next one is NASWAT or Web of Trust. And we've seen a lot of Web of Trust type apps or systems in other apps. So this is the latest one that came on my radar. I haven't really looked into it much, so I don't know how to interpret these scores, but just wanted to throw that out there. And moving on to my app, Friendster. Um, this was my stab at doing a sort of web of trust uh rating system how i came to this idea was there were already uh there were, there was already talk about having a web of trust score and then it was implemented in coracle and the way it the way it works is it's really just a proxy for a popularity score in my opinion because all it looks at is uh follows in one direction so if um, if I'm following 10 people who follow, let's say, Jack, that's going to give him a score of 10. But if everyone's following Jack, that's just going to give him a really high score. And it has nothing to do with um, uh, who he's following back. So my idea for an improvement on that was let's let's account for who is following back. So instead of just looking at a one directional follow, Let's let's um, let's look at people who are friends who follow each other. Kind of going back to uh, Facebook's um, uh, friend connection. Like, um, other than that, I don't really like Facebook at all. But I think there's something to say about looking at a friend relationship rather than a follow, because the follow system is designed to make influencers grow. So I wanted to. I, I saw the progress that Noster was making towards having you know, creating these metrics and having web of trust scores. And I wanted to try to push for something that could be um, less advantageous to the accounts that are already big, to the influencers out there. 
what are some other metrics you could use beside from the the, the one sided file? I was thinking like DMs, even though that's kind of creepy. You could be like, oh, they're actually friends, you know. There's an endless rabbit hole of different algorithms and different uh, metrics that uh, that one could come up with. And um, and it, what, I, what are some that you would use if, like, I guess you you started it, but you know, what are some other high other ones that could be high signal or that are worth exploring? other than just the one-sided follows? I guess um, you you could probably get higher signal by accounting for um, interactions, like right. have, have these people replied to each other or reposted. Um, also, anytime you start um, tweaking metrics like that, those metrics are, are gameable, right? So you can just, that can just encourage um, whatever type of behavior uh, leads to a higher score on the metric. So, so what I think is is pretty solid about having this friend score that I implemented is that there's a limit to how far you can uh, you can try to game it because um, the the architecture that Noster uses limits how many people you can follow. If I try to follow three thousand people, most relays are going to reject that contact list event because it's too large. And that's one thing I think is really it's a it's a it's a nice advantage of doing social media on a decentralized system because on Twitter and Blue Sky, I'm sure there's a limit somewhere, but there are outrageous, outrageously high limits on how many people you can follow. So you can just follow 20,000 people. And what does that mean in real life? There's it doesn't it doesn't correspond to anything in real life. It's, it's completely meaningless. I'm not taking in all that inf information. It's way beyond uh, Dunbar's number. So at least on Noster, you're limited in how many people you can follow. So you could only game this uh, this metric so far. Um, so uh, this is my app, Friendster. Uh, it it's designed as a tool for um, discovering for user discovery, right? Um, it's it's looking out in your network, and it's assigning a friend score to people that you're not already following. Um, and it's it's ideally going to take the influencers down a notch. Like they could still be there, but they're not going to be the top one. Like if I look for Jack on here, let's see. Yeah, he's on there, but you have to scroll down a few pages. So what it's favoring is people who have a lot of these friend relationships. Um, and I figured... Noster didn't already have like a find new friends feature. So it was my attempt to build it and you can follow all. So a new user who just wants to have a more active feed, they can just follow all and that's going to quickly uh, give them a more interesting feed. Uh, the next one is an app that I also made, which you can probably tell from the design. <laughs> um, and this is Noster Graveyard. So the, the motivation behind this was to be able to remove uh, people you follow that aren't active. So I just hit find profiles and it's going to, um, it's going to have to ask, the, it's going to have to do a lot of round trips with the relays uh, because uh, NASA relays have a pretty limited uh, API. So I have to ask for each profile. If you follow like a thousand profiles, it does take a while. Um, you should change that bury them <laughs> button to finish them. Uh, have the, have the uh, Mortal Kombat style. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, here's a here's a chance to circle back to um, the discussion earlier about key rotation. Here we we have Ben Ark. Well, what's he doing here? I mean, he's He's a big Noster guy, right? Didn't he found Noster or something like that? So um, why is he inactive? Well, a lot of times people do migrate keys and we currently still don't have a good way to um, help people who are following the old key find out about the new one. And this, this hit me while I was building this app and I realized that what we need is a way for uh, third parties to be able to identify uh, when someone migrated, right? So I was thinking ideally, if I had more time to work on this app, um, 
I could have I could have a feature where I could see, okay, I see this person, but I know they're active on Noster. So I should have a way to input an event saying that this is their old pub key and this is their new one. And honestly, I think that would do everything that they were trying to do cryptographically with kind zero, but I think this would do it in a um, uh, just a, a, a web of trust based way because anybody can create these attestations, but you would only want to consider them from people you trust. Um, okay, so just to complete the demo, um, I'm going to pull up my lister and I'm going to, okay, I need to log in with this user. I guess sign out doesn't work. Uh, I think no strudel. I should be able to use no strudel for this to see, uh, to see the lists in this. No strudel. Okay. Um, I need to log out and sign in with extension. Okay, cool. Now I can go to my lists. And okay, right now for this profile, I don't have any special, well, follow list is just contact list, but I don't have any NIP uh, 51 lists in this profile. Um, so if I click bury them, it should take these profiles and put them in that list. Okay, it says I have unfollowed the inactive profiles. So now if I check back here, there should be a list with them. Oh, where is it? Lists. Profile lists. Okay. So now there's a Nasser graveyard list. And it's really important to have the list because, I mean, one is transparency. Um, and getting back to the black hat approach, um, what could go wrong with this is um, people using an app like this, uh, they, the, the app could start censoring people. It could start you know, targeting people to have them removed. So how do you keep this in check? And part of that is having the transparency of having this list where these are all the profiles that were removed. So if there's so it's any- So like a fail safe if that happens. Mm -hmm. So how would someone go about doing that? I'm curious how somebody would, oh, how would you target if, someone and make them inactive? So if I was, if I was running this app maliciously and I, I could say, I'm gonna target Alex Jones. Uh, anyone following Alex Jones who uses my app is gonna have that follow removed from their contact list and not put in the Noster graveyard list either just to sneakily remove it. So at least having the Noster graveyard list, I mean, yeah, I could still be sneaky and not put it in there, but hopefully people would audit the code and, and uh, you know check it themselves, make sure the, the results add up. Um, and the, the, deep, the deep state's trying to get me off the roster. <laughs> the other reason to have to have the list, I mean, there's there's two reasons. Um, people do come back, so I don't want to just like forget about them forever. Like, so the grave the gravestone is there. It's like you know we're remembering them, but they might decide to come back, and that's cool. We'll welcome them. Yeah, back to life. So we'll welcome them back, and I can I can view the feed for that uh, for that list. And I'll do this every now and then. If I see if I see a recent post, I'll be like, "Oh, cool! This person came back. All right, great." Um, Nasser Graveyard is a shiny sigh up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, the last uh, the last thing on the list here is Jingle Relay. So I think this is a really cool project. Um, I've been I've been following uh, the the work Cloud Fodder has been doing on like cloud-based relays and it's really cool. It's, it's an easy way to get started with creating customized relays, but it's only a start. Eventually you wanna be uh, hosting these yourself. And the Jingle Relay is, it's an attempt to make relays more customizable. So it's a relay written in Go, but it uses, uh, you, can write, you can write rules in JavaScript these JavaScript files, uh, and you can customize it however you want. So uh, things like uh, blacklist or whitelist or mute words, you could implement all those. And um, uh, again, like if you just want to get started with a customized relay, 
uh, check out what Cloud Fodder made on, um, I think it's uh, relay.tools and nostr1.com, but um, that that's cloud-based. I mean, that that is not the ideal way to run Nostr. It's more just a way to play around with it. Ideally, uh, people should host these things themselves. Let's see. How are you going to use that if you use it? How would you use if, Jingle? If I was going to use it... Uh, Let's see, oh, let me take a second and look at the uh, the chat. We got a zap, 1,000 sats, and we have a question. Isn't Twitter the real graveyard? <laughs> uh, I hope Best so. Best question. Uh, that, that's, that question earned the 20,000 sats. I honestly hope that Twitter burns to the ground. Um, I... Well, Elon's gonna say to go f yourself, so be careful. <laughs> I'm he, might, he might he might hurt your feelings, dude. <laughs> uh, and I forgot what the question was before I got distracted. Yeah, by I was the, I was I was saying, uh, what would well, how use? would you use Jingle? Yeah, yeah. So I'll tell you what I'm currently doing with the uh, relay tools on Relay Tools. I'm running a Christian relay, and it's just a community relay, um, and it uses very simple rules. Uh, it, it it runs on a, a white list of words. So only only messages that contain certain words will appear on that relay. And so far, that's been working pretty well. I've also I've also had to blacklist some profiles, um, and some were being spammy. But other times, it was just because um, it, it wasn't malicious at all. But people were just um, uh, using using the words that I have on my whitelist, but not in the way that the uh, Christians of this community would would use them. And I'll just be like, okay, that th that does not belong on this relay. Uh, and so the way I would use Jingle would just be to try to replicate those rules and maybe even find more complex ways to encode rules like that. So that's everything I wanted to cover. Um, are there any questions from anyone? All right, I guess we'll wrap it up. Thanks, everyone.